Hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program produced and funded by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Ralph Eisler. And I'm Joe Barnhart, and welcome. This is a show that promotes, we hope, rational thinking rooted in scholarship and science and free of supernatural beliefs. This is a call-in show. However, we only have one phone line. So if you can't get through, mm -hmm. we invite you to tweet your ideas to us at FFTVKNOX. Now, while we go over a few announcements, we invite you to start calling in now at the number on the screen if you would like to talk to us. Get a pen and paper, and we'll give you our email address later in the show. Okay, the Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has fun time meeting at Tuesday at Barley's in the Old City, and it starts around 5.30. Look for the long table with people having lots of animated conversation. But at Matt Dilley's or Atheist Experience says, everyone is welcome for this happy hour of food and conversation and so forth. If you plan to preach or proselytize or provoke or punch, uh, hold off. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, the rationalists of East Tennessee have several regular monthly meetings. The first third, third Sundays of each month are usually lively roundtable discussions and lectures. The second book Sunday of the month is a uh, book club, which meets over at Books a Million. Uh, we have a reflections group, which mostly gets together on the fourth Sunday. It's a more intimate little group where people sit around and discuss mm -hmm. uh, topics uh, of interest there. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to uh, say his piece. So you can visit our websites for additional details, including times and locations. Location. Our main topic today is uh, Christo or Christian fascism. And I want to emphasize not all Christians are, are fascists, but it's just it, it's an imagination and the future of America. But we will highlight some I items recently in the news. Yeah, so Joe, Joe and I may have a few disagreements here on uh, yeah, certain wording as to uh, where I would say Christian, he would say some Christians or whatever. Oh, yeah. And he's, he's probably always right. So, anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> the major news since our last program, uh, of course, is the confirmation of Judge Brett Kavanaugh uh -huh. to be a justice in the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. And this was the most bitterly contested confirmation in memory as the vote was split almost strictly down party lines in the mm -hmm. Senate. Uh, the Republicans totally dismissed allegations of sexual impriety in order to ram through his appointment. They tried to shield themselves by having the FBI conduct a completely orchestrated sham investigation uh, of these claims. Uh, the investigation was preordained to exonerate Kavanaugh mm -hmm. because it had strictures that were put on by the White House who uh, wanted his appointment. Yeah. So no matter what anyone says, this nomination was strongly tied to the belief that uh, if Kavanaugh could be put on the Supreme Court, uh -huh. he might be the swing vote in deciding to uh, reverse decisions that allowed women to have abortions. Yeah, we might do an abortion program issue later yeah, on sometime. Maybe. So, if anyone doubts this, it's worth noting that in July, the Jesuit magazine, America, endorsed Kavanaugh on the grounds that he might provide the Supreme Court with the vote needed to overturn Roe versus Wade, which was the 1973 decision that legalized abortion na nationwide saying that anyone who recognizes the humanity of the unborn should support the judgment of Judge Kavanaugh. <laughs> yeah. Now, this was before Dr. Blasey Ford's accusation was made public. After the accusation came out, 
The Jesuits changed their tune about Kavanaugh, but were still dead set on promoting a judge who would overturn Roe versus Wade. Yeah. In a later editorial, they stated that for the good of the country and the future mm -hmm. credibility of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. in a world that's learning to take reports of harassment and assault seriously, it's time to find a nominee whose confirmation will not repudiate that lesson. So they came out uh, on the side that there of uh, mm -hmm. at least considering what the woman's claims were. But America's editors continue saying they were still committed to find a justice with Kavanaugh's textualist approach uh -huh. to jurisprudence that is uh, suspicious of the kind of judicial innovation uh -huh. that led to the Roe decision. They said that Kavanaugh was not the only candidate available, that there were others, but there were others that would fulfill their uh, desire there. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, hypocrisy in appealing to the humanity of the unborn for overturning Roe v. Wade. This comes from a misogynistic church that also opposes any form of birth control, which oh, right yeah. now is the main inhibition to abortion mm -hmm. in the country. They want to make sure women are under the control of men, and how better than to deny them control over their own bodies. Uh, yeah. In any case, the Republicans pushed the confirmation through the Senate. Robert Post, the former dean of the Yale Law School, Meant no words in exonerating. Excoriating. Uh, excoriating, yes. <laughs> Glad you corrected that. Yeah. Don't have my glasses on. Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation to the Supreme Court in an opened, open ended op ed published, uh, published in Political and Saturday, Saturday Post. Uh, yeah, go ahead and finish that, would you? Yeah. Uh, po uh, Post, Robert Post is a sterling professor of law mm -hmm. uh, at Yale Law School who specializes in constitutional law. And he went on to lambaste the senators oh, yeah. who voted for Kavanaugh as caring more about yeah. controlling his court than the institution's legitimacy. Oh, so this confirmation hearing is what led to the main topic of today's program, Christian Fascism and the Future of America. Okay. All right. So we'll get on to the main program here uh, we have program, here. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, let's say ordinary politics is one subject that we don't address on this program. Yeah, but, ordinarily we don't. <laughs> but because religion has become so infused into right-wing politics these days, we feel we have to talk about the growing symbiosis of religious fundamentalism and fascism. Yeah, yeah we want to emphasize when we say religion, we're talking right now about the right wing because not yeah. all religious people are right winger in this country. That, uh, that, that's and true. They're very much opposed <clears throat> to the right wing. <laughs> but but there is that hardcore, very right wing right. who wants political influence and mm -hmm. they're gaining it they right now. They about the First Amendment. And, and so they're the ones that count. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sam Harris <clears throat> uh, uh -huh. makes the point often that, okay, you, you say you look at your average Presbyterian or Methodist mainstream Christian church, says, no, these people aren't radical right people for the most part, but mm -hmm. he, he says they are enablers because they don't speak out against the strong right wing who uh, are, want to get control in the government. So, anyhow, uh, oh, we've got a phone yeah, call. Yeah, we've got a phone call. Gosh, already. Go ahead. That's good. Go ahead. Okay, uh, caller, can you give us a name or nickname? Ed is Charles from Central Illinois. Speak louder, could you? Ed is Charles from Central Illinois. Yeah, how are you doing, Charles? I haven't been on the program a while. haven't gotten to talk to you. Go ahead. Go yes. ahead. Uh, Joe. Yes. You noted earlier that... Um, in a different show, that a lot of the uh, most prominent photogenic type evangelicals don't have the same level of uh, education and biblical history as you do. Could there be a correlation between authoritarian fascist states and 
that kind of non-educated uh, religious beliefs. Well, I don't think I said they didn't have the education I have. What I think I was trying to point out is some of the ministers don't go to a theology school where, where they do three years of intensive study. Billy Graham, for example, did not. And he went right off into preaching and got involved heavily into politics very early. And he, uh, his theology was pretty much what he learned in high school. That's the point I was trying to make. Yes. And, and, and a good theology school has, and to be very fair, I, the school I went to had great diversity of opinions, and we debated constantly, both in class and out of class. We had multiple viewpoints because it was an education center. Yes, that's... Uh now, not every preacher that gets on radio or television took advantage of that. Well, that's the point. In the fascist states, uh, diversity of opinion is not acceptable. That's because the point, it, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, One of the things I've noted is that among Christians... Uh, Protestants, there's a, a sharp divide between those who uh, have gone through such an educational experience and those who don't. Uh -huh. A lot of the people that go through the uh, educational experience concentrate on elements of the Bible, such as the Beatitudes and things of that nature, and uh, the rest seem to be more interested in domination and control. Well, that's why fascism it differs from democracy. Democracy has to emphasize multiple opinions and debate, open-mindedness, and discussion. That's essential to a democratic society. And, that, and skepticism is part of thinking. In fact, all believers if they are believers, they have to be skeptics because they're skeptical of other beliefs. So what we're saying is skepticism is essential to thinking, and believing is essential to thinking. So if you're going to have a democracy, it's got to be open discussion. And uh, among the fascist states that I have... Uh uh, study the, the most, three most recent being uh, uh, El Tusse in Italy, Franco in Spain, uh, Germany under Hitler. Uh, well, in this country, we had to have, we developed early the notion of church state separation, by which it meant you can have your religion or you can have not a religion or you can have a diverse religion, but it's not the state's business so long as you respect the rights of other people. And those but are, it, are yeah, defined in the defined part of it, part in the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, like, like I was going to point out, such ideals mm -hmm. were not acceptable in those three uh, principal states of fascism in the, uh, in the 20th century. And in the authoritarian regimes of uh, uh, communism and so forth, afterwards, the so-called communists that were really one communists yes. also had that uh, same, same, thing. Yes. same thing. Yeah, uh, and getting, getting back to your first qu query about uh, education level and stuff, we, uh -huh. uh, if, if we have time here, we're going to get into... Uh, the writings of Robert Paxton, who seems to be the main expert on fascism. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says it proceeds in five stages. And I'll, I'll read you yeah, what he yeah. says the second stage is here. He says, in the second stage, fascist movements turn into real political parties, seize their seats at the table of power. And in every case that Paxton cites, the political base came from the rural, less educated parts of the country. 
And so that gets back to what your first comment was, Charles. Yes. Uh, dominate and control the education, and you can dominate and control the society. That's right. I, I mean, um, I think by less educated, it gets back to what Joe says. It gets back to people who have not had the experience of really getting debating things, but were brought up with certain beliefs mm -hmm. and have never either either had the exposure to education to debate those beliefs. Now, one of the advantages of a, of a public education is you come in contact with people who may have different viewpoints. Yeah. And you can interact. You may still hold on to your viewpoint, but it ought to be now an enlightened viewpoint. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the first thing is honesty, trying to represent another point of view fairly and accurately, not try to put it into some kind of perspective that's just a slant. But this is why most <clears throat> people who homeschool, homeschool their children, they don't want them having that exposure. Well, that's probably, a, 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 in, in many cases, I think you're right. I'm not saying everybody but, does but, that, but, but I, I think, your point. By, yeah, I they, think they, by and large that that is true. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, they, they may get, you know, that homeschool yeah. education may be okay, but then if they were going on to college and they get thrust out in the world, then... Yeah, it makes it difficult it, for it, them. Yeah, it, it makes a real yeah. uh, schism in their thinking. I remember schism. my mother, uh, who did not grow up a Baptist, <laughs> yeah. but she had a neighbor up the street who was a Baptist but open-minded. Yeah. And she said, go up and play with, with Roy and Mrs. King will talk to you. And she talked... But her view of Baptists were different from the Baptist view yeah. <laughs> down the street. <laughs> yeah. So that yeah. was another. I learned that the, when you're a Baptist, there's what version? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's true in all denominations. Yeah, and that's true. Right? Of, of, that's true of atheists. There, there's oh, some sure. atheists who are there as, as persons anybody I know. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I mean, we we know that yeah. uh, there are shades of atheism. I mean, they. Uh, Blanda Shade is uh, someone who just has no belief in God, yeah. and it runs all the way to the other end of the spectrum, somebody who will definitely declare there are no gods yeah. and everything in between. So, sure. And some even make a god out of the state. <laughs> that's maybe uh, what fascism does that's, sometimes. That's pretty much what fascism does. People uh, characterize uh, communism and Nazism as uh, pseudo-religions. Yeah, that's, that's called idolatry. Anyway. Now, um, one of the factors we must remember uh -huh. is that for a significant portion of European history, uh, there was the so-called divine right of kings. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, one of the uh, King James version of the Bible, I wonder how many of the Baptists, Presbyterians, and so forth knew that King James was... Uh, often addressed as, as your divine radiance. Well, the King you James did, that you, Yeah, to, to be fair, King James did not did not do any of the translating. He, translating, he didn't know enough. Yeah, but... <laughs> real, real scholars got into that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but um, uh, as, as put forth in the prologue uh -huh. or the prefect or whatever it is to the first, first printing of uh, the King James uh -huh. was a uh, prefect that addressed him as your divine radiance and, and addressed Elizabeth I as her late divine radiance. Well, back in those days, the king had control of the money, and that's the way they got money. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's called sucking up. <laughs> yeah, and uh, look how, uh, how people do that to many uh, mm -hmm. of the... Uh, uh, religious right types that are uh, so enamored with uh, our president of the United States. Uh, the, the, I'm talking about the more Looney Tune versions of the guys that declare him uh, uh, he was chosen by God and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. and so forth. 
Yeah. Uh, so that, that element still exists in the United States. I, ha I have a, uh, a quote, quote here somewhere in the program notes, and I pulled it off the Internet, and I admit I didn't go back and check it, but I can believe it. That Pat Robertson claimed he had a dream where he was taken up to heaven and saw Donald Trump sitting on the right hand of God. <laughs> <laughs> that's replacing uh, Jesus, if I'm not that's mistaken. That's awful awkward since there's supposed to be some there in the first place. <laughs> I, I hope that's a fiction. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm sorry that I didn't really uh, go and try to actually check it out, but I can believe it. I mean, that guy, that guy's loony. Okay. Oh, anyhow. Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for calling in, Charles. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well, uh, huh? what we had started out doing was talking about Christofascism, and uh, in my view, <coughs> uh, the uh, Republican Party was tending in this direction, but yeah. since in the last two years has really increasingly devolved into what I would characterize as a Christo-fascist cult. Uh -huh. And now, is the question of my characterization hyperbole? Is it an accurate assessment? I don't know. But well, that, I, I, that's <laughs> the way I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's a kind of a slant a slander on just the word Christo for one thing. <laughs> well, no, but the but you look at the people who are in the government. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, Trump. What what has happened here? There's this relationship between Trump and the right wing. And Christians. that's the right wing. That's what we want to emphasize there. And but not all religious people well, are right wing. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't that. I can't make this characterization. Uh, yeah, <laughs> have yeah. a lot of footnotes to it. Okay, okay? Yeah. and it basically, uh -huh. uh, they're his base. All right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, so there is this relationship that he has cultivated and keeps cultivating. Oh yeah. Where he will try to give them what they want, mm -hmm. that is power in the government if they keep bringing the votes out for him. Yeah, and, and so, that's... So, so as I say, this is a symbiotic relationship. That, a, this is the sort of thing that Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers opposed. Yes. I mean, that's why they came in with church-state separation. They did not want a church of England becoming the Church of America or that's the Church right. of Germany becoming the Church of America. The, you wanted what they wanted, Jefferson and the founding fathers, was to have liberty. And if you want to have a particular religion or not a particular religion, the state does not interfere. That's right. We, and um, we did a program. This was, I think, almost one of the first programs I did maybe eight I years ago yeah, or yeah. seven or eight years ago, whatever, uh, <coughs> on... Uh, the arguments mm -hmm. about uh, putting religious language into the Constitution. Yeah, one nation. I remember when they were trying to say one nation, then add in under God. Yeah. That was a big debate back then. Well, unfortunately, it got undebated yeah. in the 40s there. But uh, and anyhow, uh, most of the colonies that formed the United States at that time had some sort of religious test for public office. Mm hmm and either before the Constitution uh, was passed or shortly thereafter, almost all of them got rid of it. And largely under the influence of Jefferson and Madison mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Jefferson's uh, work in, in uh, Virginia mm -hmm. was uh, th one of the things he was most proud of yes. in getting that out of the Constitution. So... And before that, as you well know, in the 1600s, it was Roger Williams in New okay. England. Okay, we've got another phone call Good. here. Okay. Hello, caller. Did you hang up? Try again. Hello, caller. Can you give us the name or nickname? Thankfully. 
Well, I guess it didn't come off. Well, somehow it got cut off. Maybe we'll call back. If we're lucky. Uh, we can't now just... Uh, okay, now. Didn't uh, come through. Okay, hello, caller. Can you hear us? I appreciate your subject today, and I appreciate what you were saying about there just a few Can you speak ago. up louder? Okay, am I all right now? Yeah. Louder, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's okay, a little... Okay, well, anyway, I got something in the mail today that I thought you might be able to help me out with. Sure. The Faith and Freedom Coalition has sent out a voter guide, and they mentioned that one of their candidates is voting uh, is in favor of religious freedom for Christian businesses, and I think that's where you can decide that you don't want to do business with Muslims or or right. gays or whatever. And uh, freedom of speech for churches, which I think is where churches can form their own religious coalition to uh, endorse their candidates. Right. And. Uh, you know, Marsha Blackburn is in favor of these things, and I'm, I'm wondering if uh, if this is, uh, well, the beginnings of uh, Christofascism. Well, uh, I think we've seen the beginnings, and I think we are at least in the middle and maybe beyond the midpoint, but that's part of it. Uh, these so-called, uh, what do they call them, religious uh, freedom restoration laws or something of the sort, mm -hmm. uh, to me, just smack of Jim Crow laws. It means that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, when Jim Crow was prevalent in the South, black people could not go in a diner and sit at the counter and get served, right? It was discrimination against people. I don't see where discrimination against gays or Muslims is any different from that. Uh, and if you want to base it on your religious beliefs, I think that's abominable. Well, now, to be fair, I don't think these people are saying Muslims should not be permitted in restaurants, are they? Well, well, if you own a restaurant and you don't want to serve them, is there any difference? I, I mean, the, the, well, the... you got a good point, yeah. The, the case came up. It was this uh, guy who made uh, uh, cakes for weddings, and the gay couple wanted to make a cake, and he declined to make it on the basis of religious grounds. Mm -hmm. Now, is that any different from having uh, segregation laws, Jim Crow laws, to keep black people from eating at your public business? <clears throat> well, yes. When, when you're talking about cakes and all, it seems a little bit frivolous. I think if I wanted a cake made and they didn't want to make it for me, I would be afraid they'd put a booger in it or something if they didn't like me, and I might want to go to some places more friendly. However, when you start extending that out to places like pharmacies where you might need your medications or That's you might point, need yeah. uh, the uh, the guy that uh, operates the uh, auto parts uh, repair place to do a good job on your brakes I mean wh why I'm not too sure that it couldn't extend out to well we'll do business with them we just won't uh, you know consider all the safety factors when we're fixing their car so uh, that sort of thing seems to be at the beginning of, but but the thing about it is it, it's not so much that this sort of stuff can have a huge effect but it is an emotional trigger and i believe that that's what the republicans are doing i keep getting all these little things in the mail that have you know uh Bredesen is a uh, is you know, the antichrist or, or whatever else it is you know, he, uh, he eats dead yeah. babies or junk like that. It's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, Mar Marsha Blackburn's advertisements are just revolting. They, they just turn my stomach, frankly. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you giving me opinion on that because I didn't know if maybe I was uh, just uh, being imagining all these things. No, uh, but the 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 problem is uh, I hate to use this phrase, but the camel's nose under the tent. Uh, that once you allow people to start to discriminate against others, not on the basis of uh, their self-worth in any case, but just on the basis of what their sexual preferences are, proclivities are, I mean, that, that can just go on. You, uh, you can have an infinite set of court cases. For people okay, who don't so if I became a politician, I might start having discriminatory laws against people that don't like Star Trek. You could. 
I don't think it would necessarily uh, get very far because it's on the Well, like you said, the toe under the tent. You, you wouldn't make a profit on that. <laughs> yeah. But well, let me get off, and thanks, guys, for helping me out. Yeah. Okay, thanks for calling in. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, we s sort of got calls in that took us uh, away from <laughs> kind of logical programming here, I, okay. I guess, but... Uh, uh, we get back to uh, uh, so this how much phrase. More, how much more time we got? <laughs> oh, we have a half hour. Okay, let's get go. Ba get back to this uh, phrase uh, uh -huh. that I proposed of Christo-fascist cult. And uh, so maybe we should start asking, uh, what is a cult? Oh, cult. Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, um, well, a group that has total control... It, it um, doesn't interact with other groups. It, it's a it's kind of an enclosed group, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, most of us in education realize it, you can't have education if it becomes too enclosed. Yeah, uh, and so the Republican Party clearly will not interact with the Democrats. Well, no. If you don't interact, uh, you know, with your ideas, now, in terms of interacting, in terms of behavior, that's another matter. I mean, I don't, I don't, I can talk and debate drunks, but I don't go drinking with drunks. You see the difference? <laughs> well, it's not really talking and debating much. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. uh, one aspect of a cult is an organization with total loyalty, uh, no, uh -huh. total loyalty to a narcissistic leader is strictly enforced. Uh -huh, yeah. And we are seeing that certainly among the Republicans right now. And in fact, our retiring Senator Bob Corker uh -huh. has openly worried, yeah. and I'm quoting this, that the Republican Party is becoming a cultish thing. Yeah, so that's, that's not that's not for me. That's from that's kind a of member, a, member of the party. That's a kind of idolatry. Oh, yeah, it is. It's certainly. Uh, uh, Trump has done things that uh, are totally opposite to traditionally stated Republican values, uh -huh. such as breaking up families of immigrants or cozying up to Russians instead of our own uh, intelligence agencies, uh -huh. starting trade wars. But the party really meekly refuses to criticize any of these acts. Uh, the traditional party, Republican Party has ceased to exist. It's become the cult of Trump. Yeah, that's a good point. Is that the traditional Republican Party was much more open. It was much more. Yeah. You, but you see, it start when I was a kid. You and I are about the same age, and uh -huh. so when we when we were young, the Republican Party sort of represented the money elite establishment in the Northeast. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it, and with Eisenhower, it opened up much more. It opened up much more, but it's it it. It changed with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, 1965 mm -hmm. when the Dixiecrats uh -huh. uh, were furious at the Civil Rights Act and right. the Voting Rights Act being uh, yeah, passed. Point, yeah. And Richard Nixon and his cronies were uh, smart enough to understand this, uh -huh. and they invited these people in the South to come join their party. Uh -huh. And so that total flip, that's a total flip. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the strength of the party lies these days. Not, and and uh, even after that, though, they, you, you had Republicans uh, who were thinking about the country mm -hmm. more than sure, they were thinking sure. about their own personal power mm -hmm. or about... Mm -hmm. Uh, what religion they wanted to push on people. I mean, we uh, had. I, yeah, I remember after the Second World War, they were trying, both parties were trying to say, how are we going to reconstruct ourselves? Yeah. After, you know, our, our soldiers are coming home and we've got to deal with these problems sure. together yeah. as a country. And, t and t Tennessee had its Senator Howard Baker, mm -hmm. who was widely regarded and admired yeah, yeah. by people on both sides of the both aisle. Both sides, yes. And uh, but you don't uh, you don't see that happening these days. Is uh, 
caller before motion, uh, mentioned seeing these ads from Marsha Blackburn. I think they're, uh, uh -huh. I just think they're egregious. For instance, one of them, she says, look, Bredesen spent millions of dollars to refurbish the mansion, the governor's mansion yeah, when he was yeah, on office. Yeah. It turns out, if I recall, Bredesen never lived in the mansion. He lived in his own house. Uh -huh. And that was somebody else's Mansion. doing it if it got upgraded, okay? Yeah. Uh, didn't fall on him. Anyhow, um, well, we... <coughs> In case we're, we are at the break now, I, did, I, I take it, are we? <laughs> well, we're almost, we're almost there, so we just have a couple more minutes. And uh -huh. uh, <coughs> I wanted to, uh, I had this other note, uh, yeah. which may anger you, but... Uh -huh. Uh, one of the talking points that wanted to say the Republican base is composed of racists and evangelicals. When they talk about the base, which is what you hear about these days, that's a lot of it. Yeah, now I want to realize that times have changed. I don't think it's fair to say that the evangelicals I know, you can't accuse them of racism. That yes, I that, think that's I, that's I, been, I, I know. I know the people that you know, and you're not going. You're not going to say that. But nevertheless, eighty percent of them voted for Trump. That's that's yeah, and, one, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean they voted for racism in voting for Trump, even. Well, as they understood it. Uh, um, Nathan, can you put up that slide that has the bar chart on it? Yeah, that's good. Okay, um, this is a chart <coughs> that was made up. Uh, I forget when it was. It was before Trump started running for president yeah. or anything of the sort. It was when he started to question Obama's legitimacy as an American citizen, mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't start this movement. Some lady whose name I can't remember yeah. did, but he grabbed onto it uh -huh. as a point that he could make, uh, you know, with people, and that's how he yeah. got started in politics. Yeah. And so uh, after a while, when he put that up. This poll was taken. It says, mm. do you believe Obama was born in the U.S.? And there are four blocks, if you can see behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, if, yeah. if you could move your head just a little, Joe. Yeah, that, that way. that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the blue, the blue uh, bars there are ones who yeah. believe that Obama was born in the U.S. These are divided up into four sections of the country. Mm -hmm. We have the east, the south, the Midwest and the Far West. Uh -huh. And you'll notice in the East and the Midwest and the Far West that over 90% of people agree that Obama was born in the U.S., uh -huh. few disagreements. In the South, 50 per, only 50% believe he was born in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and uh, So your point is that's where racism was more deeply rooted traditionally, yes. and you may have a point Yes, there. and yeah. it's also where evangelicalism is more deeply rooted. And, uh, I mean, I looked at this, and it... Well, the evangelicalism that I grew up with in Tennessee and other parts of the country, yeah. particularly the fundamentalist version, was racist. But evangelicalism tried to separate from the fundamentalists partly because some of them were trying to move far away from racism. I mean, that was a conscience problem with that. And you can see that well, some, didn't, some moved and some didn't. I just want to be I, fair. I, I to know, this. but how, how long has it been since uh, Southern Baptists have allowed black people uh, into their movement, or uh, at least into positions of authority? It's only been a decade or or two decades, something like that. Oh, yeah. It yeah. hasn't been that no, long. No. And so uh, they, they did it because they were embarrassed not to. But that doesn't mean that a lot of the people that are in those congregations still uh, are at least no, have the first to black yeah. people. Segregation was so deeply rooted yeah. that you didn't have, for tradition, you did not have Southern Baptists who were African Americans. I mean, it, yeah. it was... Right, So exactly. that's why it did not develop. Now, when I went to... A Southern Baptist theology school, we had some fellow students there who were African American. Yeah, that was in the really. 1950s, yeah. early 50s. Yeah, well, it was World War II. 
started yeah, to reverse yes, the trend. Major reverse. In any case, uh, uh -huh. we've, um, we're going to take a short break here now okay. and uh, to try to uh, tell you who our sponsors are and a little bit about them. And in case you're just tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. And Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. And this is our regular time every Wednesday at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Knoxville Community Television, uh, channel 6, 12, 99, and the 193. And that depends upon your cable network. Tell your out-of-town guests, friends, to see us streamlining online at ctvnox.org. Okay, well, today's show is live on October 10th, mm -hmm. and you can call into the number on the screen and speak with us. And while we take a short break, please watch these informative videos about our sponsors. So, Nathan, if you'll play our, Break. Uh, <laughs> our, our sponsor's video. If you there. live in or around the Knoxville area and are questioning your religious beliefs or simply believe in one less God than everyone else, well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver-jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. Oh, you are back. Okay. We are back. Now, the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or sometimes called ASK, meets one or more times a week. Meetings for fun, food, conversation. Find us online at knoxvilleatheist.org. And what's the purpose? To supply a venue for community camaraderie and outreach to agnostics, free thinkers, atheists, and like-minded people in the East Tennessee area. Next Tuesday's meeting is 5.30 p.m. at Barley's in the Old City at 5.30. <coughs> right. Uh, the RET Skeptics Book Club meets the second Sunday of the month, and the book for May 13th is a... Whoa, I got that wrong. Uh, sorry, I didn't, don't have what the book is for uh, uh, okay, let's October move. 14th. Yeah, I, what it is is who we are and how we got here. Mm -hmm. Ancient DNA and the Science of the Past by David Reich. Uh -huh. So that tells you a little bit about our sponsors here. So let's get back to the program. Okay, good deal. Uh, another... Uh, Mm -hmm. point I wanted to make we can have uh, we do have some differences on this that uh, one of the basic things I see religion doing mm -hmm. is repressing women in one way or another uh, some of it is extreme and some of it is sort of subtle uh, let's take the most extreme the Taliban alright 
uh, I don't know if you remember this uh, little girl named Malala uh, uh -huh. was shot by a Taliban uh, oh, yeah. war warrior there in the head. And what was her crime? Her crime was speaking up uh, mm -hmm. in supporting the education of girls and women mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. So this is a very tribal oh, yeah, type of yeah, thing. Tribal. Yeah, this hasn't advanced very far for the last 2,000 no, no, years. In that sense. Now that's greatly different from what it has becoming, it's been coming out in this country. For example, I'm a member of a church right now, and the, man, the minister is a woman. Mm -hmm. That could not have happened 50 years ago, probably. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and that you can see, and it's no big problem now. Maybe, maybe if you had a cult, like... Uh, um, no, but it, it, uh, it, it would be quite unusual. <laughs> yeah. For, for this denomination, it's not unusual at all. And, no. and uh, even when I was in the theology school, we, they had women. And we could study with them. Right. Or they'd invite, uh, I remember uh, uh, they invited out a woman to, uh, to address us. Yeah. Because uh, she knew things that some of the guys didn't know because she had done research. Right. But, but, but let's look a little bit about mm -hmm. uh, what the history is. Uh, oh, the yeah. The evolution. Women didn't get the right to vote in this country until 1920. 20s, yeah. That means that my mother was 14 years old. Mm hmm. Uh, she, when she came of age, she could vote, but just mm -hmm. barely. She just barely got into yeah. that part when she came of age. And, <clears throat> and uh, even when I was young, there were very few jobs oh, yeah. open to women. My mother worked as a telephone operator. That was one job yeah. that was open to women, strictly women. Yeah, women could, che could teach in uh, grammar school and, and, and uh, middle school, what we now call right. middle school, right. and high school. Right. And then I was, um, I had the fortune, good fortune of had, having a few women teachers in college, but not very many. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this, this progress to the state that you're in now is, you know, it, it, it just had, didn't happen because somebody said, oh, gee, women are the same as men. These were hard fought. Hard fought things, right. and uh, even today, if I'm correct, the Southern Baptists say that a woman should submit to her husband. Well, Baptists have gone through major changes on this. They've had to, but uh, you have see the Southern Baptists split. You remember? Yeah. Around, around the what the fifties or so. Yeah. And. Uh, that was a major split. I mean, the, the theor theology in, in one branch was much more open and was real education. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was f fortunate to get in on it. And we had constant debate, and we had people coming in from the outside to give diverse viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And it was good as anything I got at Boston University or at Harvard. Mm -hmm. It was. I mean, I had just great teachers okay. who understood what education was about, but that had to come with hard debate and even some legal precedence. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take another one of my semi-extreme positions here. <laughs> okay. That uh, the um, mm -hmm. hard uh, religious right is totally fixated on reversing Roe versus Wade. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And oh. I don't buy that it's solely because the fetus has more rights than the woman. I look at it as a way of keeping women, in the old phrase, barefoot pregnant behind the plow. Well, I, don't, I won't go so far as <laughs> barefooted behind the plow, but I, I see your point. Is that it, it does say that... The fetus has a precedence over the woman's right. Right. And it's the men that, then who want to say what the fetus's right is. Right. At e that e exactly. Point. And and what makes it so hypocritical, so uh -huh. far as I'm concerned, is that these same people who make this argument are the people who are also against 
many of them, well, not all of them, against uh, birth control, oh, yeah. which was a major factor. Now, fortunately, I saw this change. For example, John R. Rice was a fundamentalist Baptist minister. He was not a Southern Baptist. He was not. He certainly wasn't an American Baptist. Yeah. He was a fundamentalist. And I remember as a high school student reading his book opposing birth control. Mm -hmm. But that was in the 40s. In the 50s, when I was in the Southern Baptist Seminary, or when I was in college even, the Baptists did not take that position. Mm -hmm. That was simply passe. Well, I, I'll t tell you when it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember all the details of this, but the Catholic Church has always been. Oh, the Catholic Church has been dra dra foot birth, dragging in birth, this. birth control and uh, abortion. And there was a court case. I forget when this was. Uh, uh -huh. Back in the 60s, maybe 70s. Uh, it was Bob Jones University court case. Mm -hmm. which, it's uh, a fundamentalist school in South Carolina. Yeah, fundamentalist, very fundamentalist school. Uh -huh. uh, uh, segregation, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and all. And um, I forget exactly what the court case was, but uh, the fundamentalists like Jerry Falwell mm -hmm. were on the Bob Jones side yeah, 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 and it. had... Uh, gathered a lot of people into the movement, you know, uh -huh. to support this and take it through the courts, etc. Yes. And Bob Jones won the case. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was. Should have yeah. looked it up. But Yes, I remember. Then Falwell started searching around, uh -huh. you know, for uh, another uh, another rung in the ladder, another peg to hang a hat on. Mm -hmm. And he kept looking for a cause there. And uh, somebody suggested abortion. Abortion issue, yeah. And he initially rejected it and said, oh, that's a Catholic thing. That's a Catholic thing. But then he started asking around and find out what people's opinions are, which can be strong one way sure, or, in those days it was, yeah. or, or another on, on it. And finally decided uh, it was a good cause. Uh -huh. And that's what they promoted. And that's what they've been living Promoting off ever since. since uh, 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 to mm -hmm. promote their theology, yeah. and, and so their contention is that a fetus, to be you know to be honest and fair from their point of view, they contend that a fetus is a person, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore to abort the fetus is to commit murder. That's their yeah. viewpoint, and of course I would argue that it, it takes my contention is it takes time to become a person. Mm -hmm. Uh, a fetus doesn't have a conscience. No. In fact, a dog's got more conscience than a fetus. Yeah. And a cat. I've got uh, two cats, and I mean, two dogs and a cat that live with, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the sensitivity, uh, the, the other day, uh, two days ago, this cat just climbed up into my lap mm -hmm. and just wanted attention. Oh, yeah. And the, sensi and, and the dogs have learned to be sensitive to the cat. Mm -hmm. And the cat is sensitive to the dog. But a fetus is not at that stage that they can develop that kind of, no, of a sensitivity. But, but, but you can see that it's, you know, that argument also, they can make it, but when you look at the extremes to which people push it, uh, you can't really buy it. Well, I remember a Baptist they, preacher, uh, and he's a fundamentalist now, opposed birth control. Okay, that's that's what I yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I mean, that that right now what they consider uh, a zygote, uh -huh. you know, a fertilized egg, uh -huh. uh, to to be the same, you know, as a six month old fetus or something of this sort. Yeah, well, yes. they have to and from that, their and logic. That's why they oppose many of these people oppose birth control. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, now most like of them have gotten over that hunt because they are are on to the abortion issue, I think, rather than against birth. And, and of course, some Catholics are still op most, mostly uh, the Catholics who are against birth control are mostly have to be monk, nuns and priests, who well, are by the way practicing birth control. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I I had. Uh, very good student, extremely bright student uh -huh. uh, in the last couple of years, but 
fully Roman Catholic. He told me he's a good Catholic, okay? Uh -huh. And he was opposed to uh, birth control, such as what they call the morning after pill. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh -huh. Because he, he said that caused an abortion. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I remember that argument, yeah. Okay? Uh -huh. And that's totally ridiculous. Yeah, because it's as if that little entity had a conscience. Yeah. And that's it, not a person. It, no, it's not a person. It, it, takes, it takes time for a human entity to develop a conscience and become a person. But these people are even opposed to stem cell research. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is... <laughs> Before you have a fertilized... Well, these are people who apparently thing. don't know. Uh, uh, being the oldest child in the family, I could see my mother with what I call the second womb, nurturing uh -huh. the child. And the aunts and uncles coming in as part of the nurturing context to turn a new infant slowly into a person. I could see it take mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. language. Infants aren't born with a language. No. No, they they're not born with a conscience. <laughs> no, they're certainly not. Developing personhood takes a second womb, and that takes time. And I was able, as the oldest child in the family, to watch my siblings. Yeah, and sure. And it was an education for me to watch sure. them grow up. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, getting close to the end of the program, one other thing I want to touch on. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, somebody... Uh, once made this comment that when fascism comes to America, it will come wrapped in a flag and carrying a cross. It's been attributed to <laughs> Sinclair Lewis, but I'm just not sure that he said it. Uh, and so we've discussed the wrapped in the flag quite a bit here, but uh, yeah. not or, or, or uh, carrying the cross quite a bit here, but not too much about wrapped in the flag. But um, we can very much what uh, look at what Trump's uh, motto is. To make America great again, right? Mm, his version of being great, that, yeah. That for some reason America is not great yeah. again. And uh, you look at the attack on the NFL players oh, who are yeah. kneeling, uh -huh. okay? This is something that he can use to strike uh, home to people's sensibilities. But well, he, right. he wants to reverse but the it, clock in many ways. Yeah, but it's total, total jingoism where, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to uh, respect your country, your flag, uh, in any case, no matter what. And that's the wrapped in the flag <laughs> bit. It's and, funny. Uh, I remember as, as a boy, I grew up a Baptist. Mm -hmm. Thinking as I talk to a flag, this seems like idolatry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this yeah. doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Well, we've only got about 90 seconds to go, and so I think we better start wrapping up here. Okay. So get out your pen and paper. <clears throat> uh, this has been Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. You can give us feedback, if you would, by emailing us at freethoughtforum at yahoo.com or on Facebook, Free Thought Forum Knoxville. You and your friends can see the, this program every Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30, Eastern Time on Knoxville Station, ctvknox.org. Okay, well, we'd like to thank uh, our guests who <laughs> called in, and yes. we'd also like to thank... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Nathan here, who has uh, been working on the TriCaster there, uh, yes. uh, and all the staff at CTV, KNOX, and, and uh, all of our viewers. And uh, appreciate the nuns out there who identify with no religion, and it's a fast-growing group in America, and you are not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rational of East Tennessee are places for fellowship, fun right here in Knoxville area. Yeah, so uh, if you have nothing to do next Tuesday, come over to Barley's at 5.30s and meet up with some interesting people. And we say to all of you secularists out there, you are not alone.